Working Cows Podcast. Episode 112. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. Howdy, everybody. It's Clay Connery, host of the Working Cows podcast, powered by the Global Ag Network, and I'm here with another episode for y'all with Wally Olson, and we're going to talk to him today about handling the difficult uh, marketing situation that we find ourselves in and how to uh, make the most of uh, all of the resources that you manage as a manager of land, animals, people, and money. So, Wally, thanks for joining me today on the Working Cows podcast. Very good. No, with with uh, the 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 markets, you need to understand that there is there's two markets. You know, there is the market where you know the the fat cattle are sold and and the futures markets and all the other stuff and the prices are established and everything. And then there's your market. And and that is, you know, how you manage and market what you have. And that's rather than, than being so important with the price, it's the relationships of your inventory. You know, there's not much you can do about the market or out there that everybody's always continually in a stew about. You know, you need to learn to step back down to your market maximize it and basically the way you do that is you have to deal with what is happening today and the relationships the inventory that you have and and you sell the overvalued and you buy the undervalued and and that's uh you know basically it and 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 tell you know if, if you're out there worrying about or fretting about you know the market it uh you know, you have no control over it. So you just need to understand, you know, how to to manage your market and, and you'll get along fine. So how often or how, how fluid, I guess I should maybe say, is the most profitable cow herds or how, how often is there change occurring in those cow herds uh, uh, that are paying attention to the market and, oh. and their relationship? Uh, the relationship of different classes of cattle within their their herd. Well, one thing, uh, one thing. Let's take a step back. And, and, and when you're talking about a cow herd, you understand what I'm saying? You know, probably the most important thing is is how you structure that cow herd. You, know, you understand what I'm saying? When you calve, and and uh, even where you ranch at, you know. Uh, you know, if you if you ranch at eight or nine thousand feet in, in in Montana today, you're having kind of a tough time of it. You know, but if you're in uh, you know southern Oklahoma where they just had some nice rains and grass was growing and life is good, you know, you need to understand uh, you know how you structure your ranch and stuff and things. And then as far as with the cow herd. You know, if you're in, it's, it's usually what you do is you, you work out, you know, what you, when it gets down to weaning time or marketing time, you know, you look at the value of gain, you know, what are they uh, willing to pay you for a calf? And, you know, do you keep it and put more weight on or do you sell it? Same way with a cow, you know, is she going to depreciate in value? So a, a large part of her calf is going to have to go offset inventory value that she is losing for you this year you know or is she a three-year-old cow that's you know not going to lose any value there's a huge difference there and, and you just basically just need to do that once a year or that's all you're going to do it or, you know once or twice a year i guess I mean, but it's just you know you just uh do it when you're going to when you will do stuff and uh, so you mentioned that people should take a look at when they're calving, and we've talked a lot about that. And I think that people can uh, definitely uh, consider 
what impact that is having on their ranch business. But uh, also you mentioned uh, where your ranch is located. And um, I recently saw a video uh, <laughs> and he was saying, you know, the, the guys, well, Greg Judy was on there and he was talking about how, uh, you know, you should probably find a place to ranch where it rains some. <laughs> and uh, the fact that a lot of the stuff that you are doing on the land will happen faster and, and land will improve faster if you're getting rain to go with it. And he, he said, now I understand that people are in the West and they love the West and they want to be there, but it's tough to, tough to do some of these things, uh, as quickly if you're not getting the moisture. Is that kind of what you're talking about? That is exactly what I'm talking about. You know, you need to, uh, uh, you know, you need to be, uh, you know, very aware of that. And also, you know, yeah, it's wonderful to live in the West. You got so many constraints with public land and and just the low productivity. You know, you uh, where you know where Greg Duty has to put in a uh, half a mile of water line. Let's say, you know, in the West, you'd have to put in ten miles of water line to achieve the same effect. And and you need to be aware of that. You know, to me, if you're going to ranch, you, you need to ranch in a country where they have lawn services. I mean, that means they grow grass. I mean, you know, you know, around me here at Claremore, Oklahoma, there is lawn services everywhere, and we grow grass here. I mean, you know, and uh, and you know, so it's it's and it's it's a it's a easy place to ranch. I mean, you know, just because. It you know we've got just like this year we've got a wonderful fescue year going so getting through the winter is going to be very easy you know we've also got warm season season native grasses so we can get gain on on cattle in the summer and, and uh, compared to lots of places it's just easy to ranch here and so what would your recommendation be for people who are on ranches in the west uh, you know manage them to their uh, you know, to their fullest potential. You know, you understand that, uh, you know, uh, we're going to just be, you know, maybe you got some, you know, desert ranch, we're just going to be, you know, almost hunter gatherers, you know, you know put the cows out there and, you know, not do much. You, you, uh, you know, you interviewed Ricky Kimmer the other day, uh, you know, what she was saying, it's phenomenal what she's done on her ranch, you know. And, uh, you know, she, she did it without a whole lot of investment. I mean, she just did it with, with skill. And, you know, in my opinion, I haven't visited with her much about it, but she, you know, they, I don't know what, what did they, twice as many or were they even higher than that? I cannot remember, but. Yeah, they're coming up on three times as many. Yeah. Three times as many. Just think what would, uh, you know, that would mean for the, the, uh, you know, for anybody, you know, make your ranch three times as big without hardly any investment, just management, you know. I think uh, Walt Davis is, 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 I can't pronounce it, his new book, uh, you know, where it's, it's sunshine, uh, you know, rainfall and management. It's, it's uh, you know, that's what we need to be focused on. I mean, the good Lord gives us most of the stuff uh we need to be very successful ranching as we just screw it up. <laughs> yeah, well, it's really expensive to try and fight against what he provides. So, yep. uh, you know, try to do it in sync with what he's providing. And I think you'll uh, be able to do it a little bit more uh, profitably or a lot more profitably, I guess. So, um, so I guess I had a couple of questions I wanted to make sure we hit from the private Facebook group. And uh, I know we're on a shorter time schedule today, but uh, there were some hypothetical situations given that I think were pretty helpful. Um, If you had a hundred cows paid for varying ages with 300 pounds, 300 pound calves at their side, what would you be thinking about doing now as we approach the fall? If you got variable age cows, I would look at, uh, you know, each age class of cows and say to myself, are they going to appreciate in value or depreciate in value or hold their own? And and if they're going to depreciate in value, I would seriously consider selling them and keeping a, a heifer calf. But you need to know, understand the relationship between what it costs you to make that heifer calf into 
a bred cow and and uh will, will it work you know most of the time it will this last summer it you know bred cows and bred cows are still down to a point where you can go buy bred cows cheaper than you can make a heifer but you also need to be very aware of mitigating the depreciation that's going to start hitting those five-year-old cows and, and, and down. If you have older cows and have the grass, you know, you, you, they aren't going to depreciate. I just keep them and raise calves out of them. I'm not opposed to older cows, you know, and everything. I'm just opposed to making them because with understanding the depreciation, the costs that, that go along with them. Would you recommend that this is a time to expand a herd because the uh, cows are undervalued, or how are you thinking about that? I would I would say this is a, a time to seriously think about expanding. If you've got the you know if you've done what Ricky's done and and and, and got more grass, you know uh, uh, you know yes, of course I would seriously look at expanding. I mean. You know, you just but you need to understand. Uh, uh, you know, you need to understand your numbers, and you know, if it works, yeah, go ahead and do it. What would you be looking to fill some empty grass, native grass, with? Empty native grass, I would. Uh, mm-hmm. <clears throat> uh, you know, I would look at the the relationships of some open young cows. I would. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I would look at, uh, you know, some, some older cows or, or buying, you know, and in, in the marketplace, you know, be cautious, but you can, you can buy some nice young cows, uh, you know, very reasonable. So, you know, whatever, whatever you can find to, to, uh, to, to do, to do that. And, and one thing that, you know, like, you know, Jim Gary, I remember reading in the Stockton Grass Farm one time, said, you know, buying high-priced cows, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with doing that, but you just need to understand you need to sell them when they're still high-priced. <laughs> you know, this, this uh, you know, right now, if you look around the cattle business, uh, there is there is a lot of stress in the cattle business right now. I, I sold some cows that I just knew I was going to get sixteen or $1,700 for last spring, you know. Because we were making hay, you know, and, and there was grass, you know, all over the country, and they were everybody was going to want them, you know, and and you know, Bud Williams talks about you know the three things in inventory, you know, you've got grass, money, and cattle, you know. Right now, uh, we don't have a lot of money, or you know, as an industry, we have lost, you know, we've lost a lot of equity from back in 2014. You know, now down to now, uh, we have lost you know, what half of the value of a cow or more. So, and and also those high-priced cows and bred heifers that were bought in 2014 are are going out as cull cows now. And uh, you know, if you can rent a $3,500 cow down to $660, you know that's that's a pretty big bite. So. So do you find that most people who are doing this well are keeping a, a younger herd or and and selling cows at the peak of their value or is it always based on what is the market selecting for at this moment? Well what what I would you know what you need to do is you, you've got to always deal with today but uh you know as cows you know you need to be very aware of the depreciation of of a cow and also you need to be very aware you know to have depreciation you have to have appreciation and very few people even talk about that but you need to you know a heifer calf lots of times is the most undervalued animal out there and uh, Mm -hmm. you know you need to but it but it goes back to your costs i mean if you if you try to get that heifer to 65 percent of her uh you know, mature body weight to breed her and breed her in, you know, to calve in February, your costs are going to eat you up, you know. But if you, if you have, uh, you know, moderate frame cattle that have, or that have been born in the, you know, in the, in the summer and, and they have had a, a summers of grass to comp- get temp- compensatory gain 
uh, you know, you can do it very cheaply. And, and if they're open, you know, you've got a really good feeder heifer to sell. So, you know, just how you do things and stuff. And when do you like to have those first calf heifers calve I, for their first time? I, I mean, uh, on green grass, whenever that is. Uh, and and I'm not going. You know, for me, I was I was a fall calving person because I had I could get through the uh, winter very cheaply on the fescue that I could stockpile, and then I also had a a uh, calf that could consume a lot of grass when uh, the spring flush came on. Yeah, one of the reasons I ask is I had a, a young lady reach out to me and say, you know, I've uh, got these May calving heifers in Montana, and the sale barn told me I should lutealize them and sell them as open heifers. And uh, she she didn't really want to do that, and I didn't blame her for that, but I was uh, just wondering what what other people out there would do in that situation. Well, one, one thing on her May calving heifers is is because she wants to sell them in the fall, correct? She wants to sell them now. That, yeah. yeah, and and what she needs to realize is that uh, the people that would buy her may calving heifers uh, are smart enough, or they're not even thinking about buying a replacement may calving cow now. Only the people that are out there interested is people that are going to calve in in January and February. You know, so what she needs to do is move her. Uh, when she's going to market those in, uh, uh, you know, March and April, when the people that are interested in May calving will be out there looking around. And if she can't do that, she probably should lose lace them and sell them for feeder efforts. You know, could you give a quick summary of the value of gain and you know the cost of gain, value of gain, all of those those things and their relationship? Well, one thing, one thing. Whenever, like, just let's just say. You calve in the summer, you know, and you have this 400-pound calf now, you know, or here. And, and and what you need to do on marketing those calves is sit and look at what the market is telling you. Are they are they willing to, uh, you know, is the market willing to give you money to put more gain on them or not? And and if it's not, you know, sell them. And if it, if it says I will, you know, give you a value, a good value of gain, and let's just say that's a dollar twenty, and it's only costing you eighty cents, so you're picking up forty cents for every pound you put on. You know, you probably keep them. You know, the market will tell you, you know, whether whether you should, you know, keep them or not. You know, and I have found that that uh, you know between a four hundred and fifty and a five hundred pound calf is the optimum calf to produce. I mean, the people that are producing, you know, 600 pound calves, you know, you are calving so early that costs just eat them up and the value of the calf, you know, nobody wants them. So, you know, so, and this is talking in spring calving marketing in the fall. If you have a, you have a, a, uh, you know, summer calving cow and calf and you carry it you know, can carry it through the winter and it doesn't gain very much, but your 450 pound calf, you know, gains a hundred pounds. So it weighs 550 in the spring in, in Northeast Oklahoma or in the tall grass prairie, you know, everybody wants that calf, you know, come March the 1st to go to grass. And it, it mm-hmm. you know, it's phenomenal. The difference, you know, there was a study done up in Nebraska that, you know, showed that, you, know, you can cut your costs, and, and it was just phenomenal the change. But but also, you may have some more open cows, and you may have some cows that you know milk too much. You'll have bad bags, and you can go on and on and on and on about why it won't work, and, and it won't work for you. But if you just you know, well, you know, we're terrified of using selection. In my opinion, you need to have turnover, and, and so to me, I want my cow herd almost to fall out as fast as I can so I can turn them over, so I can turn that money over, you know, rather than, than prop them up. Sure. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And I, I think we're short on time here. I don't well, I got, know what I, your if you, schedule If you've is. got time, I've got time. So how's that? <laughs> well, I, I, things, I've got time. Things so. change. <laughs> 
So, okay. Yes, go ahead. <clears throat> well, you mentioned in one of our, when we were preparing for this, you mentioned uh, that the the uh, Packers are looking at their depreciating equipment and kind of looking for a way to uh, maybe find a way to produce protein without having to fight against depreciating equipment. Is that uh, well, accurate summary well, of what you were? Well, one thing, you know, there, well, here, let me tell you, <clears throat> you know, when they had the fire out at Finney County out there and, and uh, uh, you know, the wheels came off of the markets and, and all of this and all of that, uh, you know, uh, you know, we realize, you know, you need to realize how, uh, you know, as far as the price and stuff, you know, it's way out of our control and, and, and things can really move the market. And you need to, you know, my thing is, is I'm always just looking at, I'm not, you know, and, you know, and what I'm about to say is Wallace Olson's opinion. You know, this is what I'm, uh, you know, but if you look at the, uh, the business of what's happening, you know, Pat Brown and his impossible you know foods you know he is set on doing away with animal agriculture sea you know fishing and all the above you know and and uh you know beyond meat and and if you look at all the protein companies are putting a huge amount of money into uh you know these alternative uh food products i won't call them alternative meat they're alternative food products and, and stuff. Sure. So, and you need to be aware that, that you know, the packing plants are, are wearing out and, uh, you know, there's just lots of things out there. And, you know, if I, you know, if I was in the protein business, you know, if I could have a vat of something out there turning out stuff, I guess I'd rather do that than go through haggling with a bunch of, uh, cattlemen to buy their cattle that they're always going to be about whatever the price is and and dealing with the workforce that the packing plants seem to use uh you know i'd get out of the business you know and it's you know it's it, to me uh, uh we are at uh you know having these packing plants uh, wearing out may be the greatest thing you know maybe it's like the steel industry you know the steel industry had these huge pack or huge steel plants and now we went to more smaller streamlined you know maybe that's what's going to happen to to the uh, packing industry and and that would be a great boost for me uh you know as far as you know grass-fed beef you know if we weren't so concentrated you know uh you could you know you could in the winter you could graze grass-fed beef in the south and in the summer you could raise it in the north and get along in my opinion very well and stuff what do you think the future looks like? I mean, as far as production of beef in, in the United States, are we going to continue? Are we going to have to go to something more like that? Or is there, what are, where are you well, at on that? Well, I, you know, as far as the, the, the fake meats and, and the fake milk and, and everything, you know, if you, uh, it's interesting, and, and I have not done enough back study in what I'm about to say, but what's really interesting is is all the vegans and everything are all excited about you know this and that and, and just putting us out of business and, and things. I'd like to check out and see what they feed their dogs, you know, because if you watch dog food ads, you know, it's all whole meat and whole foods and few products, and then here we go to feed ourselves, and we're you know, got all this processed stuff in it, you know, and things. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's just, to me, it's interesting. And, and when there's as much turmoil going on, uh, you know, if you can understand and handle the turmoil and be on the right side of it, it's very profitable. You know, see, to me, uh, agriculture is, it feels a lot. I went through the 1980s and it mm -hmm. feels, just like that, you know, there is nothing really big going on yet, but profitability has been now that, you know, and so it's just eating up the equity. And, uh, and I'll, I'll give you an example of that. I sold some cows at Coffeyville livestock auction, you know, and, and these were fall calving cows, eight months long, they were black and they weighed 1400 pounds. They were perfect four and five year olds or i'll put it this way when you go to a cow sale and you don't have to stand in line to get a cheeseburger you better be worried you know 
<laughs> and there wasn't very many people there. And Brian Little, I mean, he worked himself to death. We got them sold, but they sold for twelve hundred and fifty dollars. You know, mm-hmm. and and uh, and if you lay and everybody says, well, gosh, that's terrible. I said, well, if you look at, you know, a five year old cow is going to depreciate. You look, you know, picking up a heifer calf or keeping a heifer calf, it works. It just doesn't work quite like it used to, but it still works. I mean, and if you look at the market, there is some stalker deals that work, but we have allowed our costs to get out of control to, uh, you know, and we've got to, you know, bring our costs back. You know, in, in the 1980s, it was it was still cost, but it was interest costs that, that wreaked havoc and mm-hmm. other costs were rising. And, and now it's just we've allowed our costs to get out of line. You know, we got to living too high, you know. You, know, you got to understand the difference between living good and living high. You know, we just allowed ourselves to uh, let our costs and it it hurts to bring your costs back. You know. And, yeah. So your are you thinking if I can sell these cows and replace them as bred cows with a heifer cheaper than I can keep them around, then I will. I'll sell these cows yes. and buy a couple of heifers in their place. Yep, or buy a heifer to replace her and, and, and ha- have the money, you know, to make her back into the, the bred cow that you sold. And you've picked up, you know, a younger cow and uh, and stuff. So, you know, you, you did a good trade. You know. Just need to be always aware of the relationships of the market. And as far as, yep. uh, as far as, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, beef industry, you know, it's, uh, you know, to me, it's in, in, in a scary place because, uh, you know, people are demanding, you know, uh, sustainability and, and all of this. And, and if you are to be completely honest with the beef industry, it is, in my opinion, not very sustainable. And and the reason is is, is the uh, the dead the dead zone in the Gulf is growing. You know, a lot of that that is pollution from farm ground that is for uh, you know to raise soybeans and corn for the protein sector, and uh, and then you know everything we we have to transport it and and uh, you know the health of the animals is is. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, 30 years ago, I started in the stocker business again after the debacle of the 80s. And we had uh, $8 in vet cost and we had a 3% death loss. This year, we've got a $31.50 vet bill or, you know, starting cost in them. And, uh, you know, and we, we start budgeting 5 to 10% death loss. So we've really came a long ways with uh, in the last 30 years. So. You know. Yeah. Do you think that the the future is going to be more uh, kind of like you were talking about streamlined and direct uh, to consumer marketing, or is there? Well, there are we a few steps away from that yet? Well, I don't. Yeah. Well, I don't know if we're going to be. You know, there's going to be uh, uh, companies. I mean, you know, there there will be. People that will be marketing this beef, I, I doubt if it is the ones that are there now. I mean, it's going to be someone, uh, you know, different. And, uh, but there were, you know, and I do not know for sure how that's all going to evolve and, and uh, things. But I, I foresee, uh, you know, you will have animals that, uh, you know, that are, are, you know, we know how to, you know, we've, we know how to do everything correctly or, or i don't know if that's the right word we know we've got the you know the knowledge to do stuff to alleviate a lot of the problems you know uh an example is uh, you know if you fence line wean your calves you know i did it for years and doctored very few if any you know so that there there you've chopped 31 dollars out of your business you know uh, and if you're a stalker operator or a grazer, you know, you need to be aware that if I buy that calf, you know, and uh, I don't have to put uh, the $31 in it, 
you know, that's worth uh, $7.75 a hundred weight. You know, you just need to be aware of that. And, and you just, uh, I mean, we need to, uh, you know, with, with the coming of the regenerative agriculture, I think that's the most interesting thing happening out there right now, you know. And, you know, we don't need feed yards. We do not need to be, uh, you know, shipping, having corn trains go from Springfield, Illinois, to Hereford, Texas, hauling corn and then piling up all the nutrients out there. You know, you don't realize, you know, that we're transporting a lot of our wealth, you know, out there and they can't utilize it out there. So, you know, having that, uh, you know, putting that manure back on the ground in a, in a, grass fed or grazing situation, you know, it's just awesome, you know. Right. And and we need to we need to quit thinking about uh how we need to get premiums for grass fed beef and we just need to be profitable, you know. And just produce mm. this stuff cheap. Yeah. You've mentioned a few times that you have to understand the relationships uh within your cow herd and you're talking about the relationships of the value of one class to another is that right that's correct you need to understand that you know a a heifer calf you know and you know as bud williams would say uh, you take a heifer calf and her value and some money and you can turn her into either a feeder heifer or a bread heifer And, and is that profitable and that bread heifer you know she will have a calf and give you uh, you know, uh, that calf will give you income. And, and so, so, you know, and then, you know, three-year-old cow, the four-year-old cow, you know, they, they hold their value. The five-year-old cow in path, they start losing value. So you need to understand that maybe I should, uh, you know, sell that, uh, you know, five-year-old cow and, uh, uh, you know, keep that heifer calf. And then in the grass fed beef business, you know, uh, or, uh, grass finished, you know, maybe we should be looking at, uh, having very easy calving, early maturing genetics and, 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 uh, you know, calve those heifers once and, uh, uh, and then put them in a grass fed program. You know, we're going to have to deal with a 30 month age deal and we're going to some things, but, uh, you know, that could be phenomenal. And also when you do that, you know, that three-year-old cow, you know, you can capital gain, sir, which and when you become profitable, taxes become a concern. And you need to understand how to handle those. You, know, you need to understand how to manage it. Just like managing anything. It's just a cost. So you need to learn how to manage it. We do a very poor job of it. You know, we'll go buy a pickup truck or we'll go buy a combine, mm. you know, Yep. And we usually borrow money to do it. And then that's what really gets us in trouble. Yeah, for sure. So we had a question, another question in the private Facebook group yep. says that you have quite a story that led you to the conclusion that if you wreck your marriage to be a successful cattleman, you have failed. And if you wreck your cattle business to save your marriage, you've been successful. So kind of going back to what you were saying about this feeling like the 80s, and uh, there were a lot of casualties of the 80s, not the least of which were some marriages. Um, and so I, I guess if you're willing to, I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Well, one thing, one thing that came out of the 80s for me was the 10-year rule. And, and that is, is it really going to matter in 10 years? And, and, and what that boils down to is your health and your family. And, and so, so uh, we, there is going to be, uh, you know, coming, you know, it's there now and I feel for them, but we just, and I'm talking to the males out there, they just need to understand that there's a time, you know, when it's time to call it quits. This isn't working. We cannot bail you out. You cannot borrow any more money. The uh, structure of your business is plan is wrong and you just need to stop. There's laws and rules in this uh, country on how you unwind stuff, you know, and don't let the guilt get to you. We have all been through there. Everybody, I grew up with an older gentleman by the name of Orville Burtis Sr. And Orville would would tell you, uh, and I learned so much from him, but one thing he told me, he said, 
He said, Sonny, if you're going to be in the cattle business, you better be prepared to go broke once because you're going to, you need to go broke till you're, that's the only way you're really going to learn how to make money. And, and Oral Burtis is right. And gobs of us have been there and people are willing to help people out, you know, uh, uh, you know, but you need to, you know, you need to just face up to it that it ain't working and it's just time to, you know, realign. And, and I don't know, you know, that may be going to get a job, I mean, and stuff. And, uh, and, uh, you know, back in the eighties, there was a lot of guilt, uh, where, you know, we were losing the, uh, uh, you know, the family ranches and the family farms and, uh, the thing was is those those ranches were probably lost before you even took over control of them hmm. but but they had the equity that they could burn up, and also they did not uh teach you know teach the next generation how to manage because they didn't know how to manage because uh, as long as you could produce, you could get by you know and right now we you know we're we're thriving, thriving on, you know, everybody, the, you know, the land values have went up. So everybody's been able to borrow more money and borrow more money. And, uh, when this bubble pops, it's going to be interesting. And stuff. <laughs> so you just need to, you know, you need to, I'm all seriousness, you know, uh, look, you know, guard your health and guard your family. Cause, uh, and, uh, you can get through it. It's just need to, address it you know and, and uh, there's people out there that help you i mean uh you know i invest with young people and, and i i invest with young people in their mid-30s because i know that people in the mid-30s have been through a glitch in their life and and uh, they are willing to understand that the only reason we're working is to be profitable then we can do all this other stuff but you've got to be profitable first yeah that's it it and also also you know uh I, I I would like to know where we turned, in my opinion, is turned, especially ranching, in such a hellhole. I mean, God, we calve in the middle of winter and we put up hay and we do this and we're in such a hurry to produce something that nobody wants, you know. And uh, let's just make it simple and fun. You know, there is people out there that are doing it and, and you know, understand that it can be done, you know. Yeah, I was looking for it and I couldn't find it, but somebody said, you know, the, today's cattleman might be the only businessman who tries to tell the market what they want rather than listening to the market that's, and producing what they want. That is absolutely right, you know, and uh, yes, and, and and we get we get mad, you know, uh, uh, and, and I, I'll give you an example, you know, if I, I like to ask why. I'm interested in why people do stuff. You know, and, and boy, they get instantly mad. And the reason is, deep down, they know, uh, 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 you know, they're wrong. And, and one example is, is the beef checkoff, you know. You know, since the beef checkoff uh, uh, started in uh, 1985, you know, uh, we have been on a, uh, you know, we had consumption, I think it was uh, like, consuming 79 pounds of beef and in 2018 we we're down to uh 57 pounds of beef you know you know why why do it and at this meeting where we were discussing this i said well what would it have been like uh you know who wouldn't have the beef check off well i don't know but i i know what it was like with the beef check off you know and <laughs> you know i'm not i'm you know i just I'm just looking at this, you know, I'm looking at the, you know, in 2012, I think grass fed beef was at 17 million pounds. I think I, I know it's 17 million something, but I didn't back check it. very good. And in 2016, it was at 272, you know, maybe the beef checkoff ought to step out there and, and promote that, you know, there's, there's growth, but, but it's going right. to counter what is perceived as, as the beef industry. And, and, and I sell my cattle to feed yards. You know, I would, if it's profitable, I would probably put some cattle in a feed yard, you know, I'm, you know, but just what I see. And I, you know, I think that there, 
Adam Smith wrote the book, The Invisible Hand of the Market, or he, he, you know, kind of coined that term anyways, The Invisible Hand of the Market. And the the hand changes and starts to demand new things and it's coordinating all of these services and we have to be willing to fit into that we can't try to fight against it again it's like fighting against nature it's going to be very expensive yes and and just like uh uh you know it's just you know it ranch you know like i said ranching uh uh, you know, should be, you know, if you use David Pratt, you know, you know, healthy lands, happy families, and a profitable business. That's all you you need to be working for that. You don't need to be working for, you know, a bunch of the stuff that we are so into, you know, that we think is so critically important. You know, those are the three things we need to do and, and, and do it. Just like, uh, you know, up there where they're, uh, putting in the prairie preserve in Montana, you know, and and I was watching a ranch wife talk about how the injustice of that. And the reason they're able to do that is ranching is not profitable and the young people aren't coming back. There's plenty of young people that would be more than willing to come back, but it's not the way we're doing things is not profitable. I've talked to many, uh, young couples that are interested in, uh, you know, coming back to the ranch, but, you know, when they come back, you know, find out that, uh, you know, dad is either scared or unwilling to change, you know, and we don't, we don't have the wealth to retire. You know, we've got to either sell the ranch or, or, you know, keep grinding it out. So. You know, and another thing about the American Prairie Reserve is that, there's obviously a market for people who are going to uh, return the land to um, a more native state. Yep. And if we could communicate a story to people that we are returning the land to a native state using animals, there probably be, would be investors for something I, like that because they're doing this with investment funds. That's right. They're in, in the American Prairie Reserve. So I think if we could communicate that we are doing – probably i would say a better job than the american prairie reserve is uh then then uh i think you could probably find investors for something like that i think you are absolutely correct you know and and, you know that's you know just like uh you know to me you know we talk about weaning weights and stuff and different things and that we brag about you know one thing is is uh you know, we need to know, you know, how much organic matter is in our soil. You understand what I'm saying? You know, and, and have it documented. You know, I've got, I had, right. when I left the ranch up there, I had some soil that was 8.7% organic matter. Well, if I can tell you wow. that I could store, you know, I could hold back by myself. No, I'm just kidding. You know, <laughs> you know, the rise in sea level by just, storing that water and letting it come out you know i mean well that is you know get that into the to you know the soil and then and, and stabilize stuff and also we need to understand you know talking about you know gr- you know green water blue water and gray water you know we need to be able to talk about that you know the the cattle business is or the ranching business uses lots of just green water when the good Lord gives us the rain and, and we utilize it. And with the organic matter, we store it and, and, and not let it come roaring down, uh, you know, and flood your homes and stuff. So, you know, I think there's lots of opportunities out there. We just got, yeah, and, and you got to understand that, you know, everybody, you know, they talk about out of the box and in the box thinkers, you know, the paradigm that you're operating under, you are absolutely correct. You just may not be in the correct paradigm, you know, and, and when you change, go to change that, you're going to get a lot of hostility. I mean, hatefulness, you know. Well, and I think, you know, if you can, if you can communicate that, I mean, if you, if you have those numbers of your organic matter, when you started on that piece of land and your organic matter now, and they want to start paying you for carbon credits, That's right. you know, there's another income stream right there, but you've got to be willing to do the work to document the progress of your, of your land. And 
So it's, it, I think, like you said, in this, you know, Luke Perman, uh, a guest here on the podcast before, uh, had a really good thread the other day. I'll link to it at the show notes page for today, workingcows.net slash 112, workingcows.net slash 112. I'll link to his thread about opportunity in uh, today's agricultural climate and how he's maximizing some of his opportunities. So uh, I think there's opportunity out there if people are willing to think outside the box and, and act differently. And uh, if your parents won't let you uh, act differently, maybe it's time to find some place where you can go and act differently. And as as we've talked about here today, maybe it's time to go to a place where uh, you get a little bit more rain so that acting differently will pay you dividends faster than it does <laughs> in a place where it's a little drier. So, uh, Wally, I appreciate your time today. Yeah. I, I'm going to throw some links up at the show notes page, uh, workingcows.net slash 112. Uh, are you still doing some marketing schools? Yeah. Got some coming up? Go or? to, go to Olson Ranch LLC and they're there. And all my contact information is there. If somebody needs to call, uh, please tell them it. Please do that. I will. I will definitely do that. I'll link to that at the show notes page for today. Wally, thanks for your time today. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. Oh, one thing, one thing you got to realize there's, there is two big things happening uh, today and tomorrow, or well, not today, but one is that, that ranching for profit, David Pratt, this is his last day, and tomorrow is Dallas Mount's first day of owning ranching for profit. <laughs> and and if you if somebody wants to, that is the first thing you need to do to start getting out of the hole is to go to a ranching for profit school. Yeah. I, and I've heard stories of guys who sold cows to go, <laughs> go <laughs> well, to the yeah. market, sell a couple cows so you can go. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's, it's worth the, worth the yep. investment, do whatever it takes to get there. So very good. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wally. Bye bye. Yep. Have a good day. Really appreciate uh, Wally's time again. Uh, very much encourage you to check out the show notes page for today, workingcows.net slash 112. There will be, uh, links to all of the things that we discussed there today, links to Luke Perman's Twitter thread, as well as links to Wally Olson's website and upcoming marketing schools and his contact information there. So go ahead and check out workingcows.net slash 112. And I'm really excited to be a part of one of those upcoming marketing schools. So I will be there in November at his marketing school in Claremore, Oklahoma. Also really excited about next week. Episode 113, we're going to talk to David Neeson, and we're talking to him about some really interesting things in regards to how we relate to one of the coolest tools that we get to use in the uh, ranching industry, and that is horses. We're going to talk horsemanship with David Neeson next week on episode 114 of the Working Cows podcast. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week.